For the rest of our day, we're going to get into 8.2. The only thing I want to talk about is something called function notation. That's one of those words you have to say very carefully when you're on videotape. <laughs> that and shift. We're going to be shifting graphs in section. We're going to do lots of shift. That's some serious shift. We got to go on. <laughs> Okay, that joke never gets old. Function notation. And we'll talk about some graphs of nonlinear linear functions, but we'll do that next week when we come back. Function notation, we've seen it in this class before, but I've never explicitly gone over it, and I want to do that today. This right here, when you see f of x, that's how you say that, when you see f of x, that's called function notation. And what this is, is this stands for a function, bless you, stands for a function whose what we call independent variable, whose independent variable, that's a variable you plug stuff into, independent variable is what you plug stuff into, whose independent variable is what, what's the variable up here? It's x, yeah, that's all it's the same, it's a function whose independent variable is x. Functions, so it tells you the name of the function, that's f. It tells you the, the variable of the function, that's x. And the reason why we use this is, I've talked about this before also, we could write the same function two different ways. Y, well, this is how we normally see functions, right? We've been dealing with this a lot. Y equals 3x plus 2 or f of x equals 3x plus 2. These two things right here are exactly the same. If you graph this one and you graph this one on a graph, you would get the same looking line. I don't know if you follow me on that. Same thing. Why in the world do we even talk about this when we already have this one? And the answer is for two reasons. The first reason is if you need to graph more than one line on the same set of axes, this way lets you identify them. This way doesn't because all of these will be y equals y equals y equals. You can't tell the difference just by looking at the line, right? This one you do f of x, g of x, h of x, and so on and so on and identify every unique line. You with me on that? Also, what's kind of nice is if I tell you... If I tell you, let's plug 2 in. If I plug in 2, how much am I going to get? Eight. Yeah. So if I plugged in 2, I'd say y would equal 8. Right? Does that tell you what I plug in just by looking at this? And the answer is no. If I plug in 2 over here, here's what we could do. We'd say f of 2 equal 8. That not only tells you what you plugged in, it also told you what you got out. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. So here, if you plug in two, I just told you that, and you, you know it, but it doesn't say that here. So if someone else were reading this, they'd have to do the work backwards to figure out what you plugged in. Here, I say, oh, what did you plug in? What did you plug in? Two. Yeah, look how it took the place of x. You plugged two in for x, right? And what did you get out of it? This gives you an ordered pair. This gives you a point. Anytime you see this function notation, you can say, oh, I plugged in 2, I got out 8. That's kind of nice. It makes things a little bit easier for someone else who didn't do the problem to recognize your points. And that's one of the reasons why we use that. Well, I think that's about it. Do you guys understand the idea of function notation and why we're going to use it? Okay. Okay, so let's start talking, like I said, about square roots. Finding a square root is literally just the opposite of squaring a number. So while squaring a number says take a number, multiply it by itself, what do you get? Square root is the opposite. It says take your number, what number times itself will give you that number? So we're, we're going in reverse of squaring a number. With that in mind, and I know you've all seen square roots before, so these should not be a surprise to you. 
That's the square root symbol. This is the square root of 49. So what is the square root of 49? The question is, what number times itself will give you 49? <coughs> How much? Seven. seven. Good. Now, is it seven or the square root of seven? Seven. seven. It's just seven. You don't keep writing that square root. So once you take the square root, you're, you're done. So what, what I mean by that is, here it's pretty clear we have seven, right? But if I give you something like this, what I don't want to see is, oh, the square root of 16 is? Four. And the square root of 4 is? We don't do that. Okay? Once you take the square root once, you're done. I mean, it's just one little step. Does that make sense to you? You don't keep taking a square root until you can't possibly take it anymore. That would kind of ruin your problems. So with this one, we're not, we're not talking about the square root of 4. We're talking that the square root of 16 really is just, well, it's just 4. Let's try a few more square roots. Um, that'll pretty much be about it. How about the square root of 121? Anyone know the square root of 121? Good. How about the square root? Square root of 36. Good. Well, you guys are really good at this. It's fantastic. How about the square root of? One ninth. Is that okay to take the square root of a fraction? Yep. Yeah. One third. Why? Because uh, if you put the um, second power on both of them, it makes one ninth. Like if you get one third and put squared on both, it makes one ninth. Like that and like this? No, without the. Uh, okay. Well, you you can do this. This is legal, and that you are right. You are going to get the square root of one is how much? One. And the square root of nine is three. So that's how we do get the one third. We take the square root of both the numerator and the denominator that works out for us. <clears throat> We're going to learn later that a square root actually is an exponent. Not an exponent of like two or three or a whole number like, like we thought, but something else. It's kind of interesting. How about the square root of one over 81? How much is that? Nine. Nine? One nine. nine. Oh, one nine. Good. How about the square root of negative 64? Eight. Okay. Negative eight. Negative eight. Negative eight. No. What? I don't know. You guys are guessing <laughs> now, huh? <laughs> let's say let's say we did eight. What's eight times eight? It's not. You can't. There's no square root. Explain that. You can't multiply two negatives. Well, you can't do a positive. It's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, you're Negative just getting positive. mad at it. You don't get mad at it. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right. You're right. You actually explained it really well. Um, you can't take a negative times a negative and get a negative, can you? You can't take a positive times a positive and get a negative, can you? Only way you can do that is if you take a positive times a negative. However, that's not, by definition, the same number, is it? So you, you can't do this one. You go, okay, if I picked 8... 8 squared is 64, negative 8 squared is 64, not negative 64. So in, in this example, you go, how am I supposed to take the square root of a negative number? And you can't do it in what are called the real number systems, um, like integers, rationals, reals. You, you can't do it. Uh, it's not possible. Now, when we get further on in this, in this course, we will be able to accomplish this problem, but it won't be in what are known as real numbers. Remember talking about real numbers as far as domain goes? It's pretty much every number that you know of right now. Uh, you're going to learn a different number system in a few weeks, like, uh, like three weeks. We'll, be, we'll talk about that. It doesn't make it any harder or anything, but it says that this is possible there. For right now, what we're going to say is there is no real solution. Don't put no solution, because we will find one eventually. It's no real solution. Now my question is, is this example different than this example? Yes. What do you think? Does it become negative after you find that square root? That's what it does. This is saying the square root of negative 64 where the negative is inside that square root. This one basically says this. How much is the square root of 64? Eight. Now take the opposite of that. So this is the opposite or the negative of the square root of 64. This one has a solution. This is just fine. This is negative 8. Notice the difference? If the negative is inside of our square root, we, yeah, we can't do it. That's no real solution. But if it's outside, it, it's really not being applied to that square root. Okay.
Again, which one's which one's possible here? The top one or the bottom one? Top one. Okay, top one will be how much, folks? Negative twelve. Good. And the bottom one, again, we say no real solution. No real solution. Would you raise your hand? Feel okay talking about these square roots? Good. So we can take square roots. We know that if the kids are outside the square root, that's okay. But if they're inside the square root, that's not okay. That's no real solution. And finally, when we take a square root, we don't keep writing the square root. Once you do it, it's over. You're just done. You do it one time, and then you call it good. With you on this? Okay, very good. Now, let's talk for the rest of our, our time in section 8.2 about some nonlinear functions. Question for you. What did linear mean, by the way? Okay, if linear means nine, line, what's nine? It means nine. Nine lines. I am part German, you know that, right? I could say nine. Like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I crushed this mathematics. What now? The cheating man. The run it says the running man? No, cheating man. Yeah, okay. Did he cheat? I don't watch the news. He has, a, he has like a 10 year old kid with a, with a nanny. Yeah, but if you're rich, it's okay. <laughs> I would just jet up and smile. It's, it's called a double standard. You guys didn't know those exist? Anyway. Uh, if, it's not just politicians, it's rich people. That was all the time. <clears throat> like me, I'm super rich, right? I can do whatever I want. So. <laughs> I'm famous. Obviously. Um, so if, if linear means line, what does non-linear mean? Non-line. Non-line. That doesn't mean we're going to be drawing dots everywhere. I mean, lines mean for us straight lines, so we're going to be drawing curvy lines somehow. Or non-perfectly straight lines. Are you with me on this? That's what we're going to get out of these things. However, we really don't know the shapes of any of them at this point in our, um, in our studies. So we're going to have to make some tables up like we did before. So in order to do your nonlinear graphs, like on your homework, what we're going to do is make up a T table. And there's one key point here. So make a table. The thing about nonlinear graphs is they're not lines. So you don't know exactly what they're going to do on each side of the y-axis. For that reason, we have to pick some positive and some negative numbers. Does that make sense to you? Because sometimes they switch at the y-axis. So make a table, but use both positive and negative numbers. Let's do a couple examples here. By the way, when your book talks about function notation, all it means is it's using f of x instead of y. That's the only thing it means. So function notation would be like this. Let's graph f of x equals x squared. That would be kind of nice, right? We've dealt with a lot of x squareds in this class. We'll finally be able to see what these things actually look like when you graph them. And I also want to talk about g of x equals, let's try negative x squared. Well, X there and...